Okay, you have made it to your final video lecture for unit one. It's the shifting of supply and demand. Remember in the last video and in class, we we're talking about any change that isn't price can shift the entire curve to the right or to the left, right? So anything outside can actually change our equilibrium price and our equilibrium quantity by shifting supply or shifting demand. So that's what we're going to look at right now, the different determinants or shifters, they call them, of supply and demand. So let's start with demand. One of the big outside determinants or shifters of demand is something you're all familiar with. It's a change in taste. This doesn't actually mean the taste of something. It means our change in desire for it, right? People's tastes change in all kinds of, uh, kinds of ways for all kinds of reasons. For example, Starbucks over the last decade has seen a dramatic increase in a change in taste. Right? Everybody wants a Starbucks. It might be the status of holding the Starbucks. It might be the actual taste of the Starbucks. It might be the rewards program. It might be that they're everywhere, and so they're just ubiquitous with coffee now. I don't know what it is, but I do know the demand for Starbucks coffee has gone up significantly because of the change in taste. The opposite is true here for Jinko jeans. For Jinko jeans, the change in taste has gone down. Nobody wants these Jinko jeans anymore, and as a result... They were, used to be very popular when I was in high school. Um, but as a result, people used to pay $140. They're not going to pay anything for these anymore. So the demand has gone to the left in a significant amount. So remember, an increase in demand shifts demand to the right. A decrease will shift it to the left. So if I were to draw these two real quick, my Starbucks, I would have my demand curve here, my supply curve here, and my initial equilibrium my initial price, my initial quantity. I'm just doing a quick one here. For Starbucks, the demand would have shifted to the right. We show that by changing my demand to D2, not just D, but D2, showing the change and drawing in our little arrows. Now we have a new equilibrium. So what happened to my price? Price went up. What happened to my quantity? Quantity went up. And I think we can see that. More people are buying Starbucks, and the price of Starbucks has gone up. Jinko jeans would be the opposite of that. All right, so let's try one out. New studies come up that show that apples prevent balding. Go ahead and draw that graph and show the impact that this new realization about apples will have on the apple market. So you're going to label it apples, and then draw your demand, downward sloping demand, upward sloping supply, price and quantity, and then show the shift. I'll pause. Okay, I'm pause. Let's try this out together. So I'm going to call this apples. Maybe. This is going to be my apples. A P P L E S. I have drawn my demand curve. I've drawn my supply curve. I have my initial equilibrium right here where demand equals supply. I have my initial price. I have my initial quantity. Now, if people believe that apples prevent balding, then they're going to demand a whole lot more apples. So we're going to show an increase in demand. He did this, he did it correctly. People want more. Demand is going to shift to the right. I draw my new, it's parallel to my other demand curve, label it D2. I have my new equilibrium. I dash over. That gives me a new price. I call it P2 because I have P1. What happened to price? Price went up, which makes sense. People want more apples. Demand for price, the apples goes up, the price will rise as well. My quantity is also going to rise. More apples will be bought and sold as a result. Okay, did you get that? If so, you're tracking. Let's keep going. Our next determinant is number of buyers, right? Let me pause real quick. i got to close my door. And I'm back. Sorry about that. Uh, so number of buyers, that's the second one. So people, more people enter the market. Eh, more people enter the market, right? So when does that happen? Well, it happens when there's changes to our demographics. For example, uh, this is Billy Graham here. When Billy Graham went on the Crusades, uh, not went on the Crusades, but started doing these televised uh, sermons that ended up resulting in conversions, like a crazy amount of people becoming Christians, right? There's a huge new number of buyers in what market? Right, in the Bible market, in the Jesus fish market, and Billy Graham audio tape market, right? 
Uh, so there's a lot of marketplaces that were affected by this because there's a huge influx of buyers in that market, right? In the same way, we have these baby boomer populations, just a portion of a population's age demographic where there are a whole lot of people, a lot of people in the ages 60 to 85 range right now, right? So when that bubble of population gets older and older, what kinds of goods are impacted by that? Well, of course, uh, we have anything that caters to elderly people. So that includes, I don't know, uh, nursing homes, that includes Depends, that includes um, uh, graveyard, cemetery plots, things like that, right? Uh, not to be funny, but to be frank. Uh, so there you go. That's, that's what's going to happen there because there's a new number of buyers that are entering that market. So if I were to draw one of these, let's look at the market for... Bibles. I would just draw this in. I would write Bibles up here, but it takes a long time, so I'm just going to do B. I know I label my axes, price and quantity. I have my demand for Bibles. I have my supply for Bibles. Bill the Graham comes to town, talks of the good news, Jesus for, uh, dying for our sins. People are moved by that. And as a result, demand shifts to the right. For Bibles, because people want to read about this for themselves. When demand shifts to the right, we have a new price, a new quantity given to us by our new equilibrium. So price will go up and quantity will go up. A shift right because there's a new number of buyers in the market. Okay, let's try this out together. There we go. Uh, let's say there's an epidemic of poison ivy spread throughout the Midwest. Hundreds of thousands are stricken. Draw a graph that shows the impact on the poison ivy medication market. Show the change in P and Q. Okay, let's do it together. So this is the poison ivy medication. I'm just going to do P, I, and poison ivy medication. We have our downward sloping demand, upward sloping supply, initial price, initial quantity. What's happening with poison ivy medication? Well, of course, demand is going up. If more people have poison ivy, then there's going to be people entering this market that weren't in it before. Demand goes to the right. We have a new equilibrium. We dash over. That gives us a new price. We show that price is rising, and that gives us a new quantity. It shows us that the quantity being bought and sold of poison ivy is going up as well. Okay, let's keep going. Price of related goods. We have two types of related goods. We have substitute goods and we have complementary goods. Substitute goods mean that there's another good outside of the primary good we're looking at that is a substitute, right? So let's say you're getting gasoline and you have BP and you have Shell, right? They are perfect substitutes of one another. So if you get gasoline from BP, it's no different than getting gasoline from Shell. It's the same gasoline. It's going to fuel your car the same way. So if the price of BP gas goes up, then what is going to happen to the demand for shell gas? Well, if BP is more expensive, the demand for shell gas is going to rise. Make sense? People are going to want shell instead of the higher price BP right next to it. And vice versa, if BP price, the other good, the related good, goes down. Now BP goes down, all other things cost, and what's going to happen to the demand for shell? Well, it's going to go down. People would rather get the lower price BP, so they're going to demand less of Shell. So think of it that way. You have a primary and a substitute good. If the substitute good's price goes up, then the demand for your good is going to go up. Direct relationship. If the other good or substitute good's price goes down, people are going to want that instead. So the demand for your good is going to go down. Both of them going down. Direct relationship. Okay, so let's try this out. Let's say the price of tea doubles due to a flurry of reenactments of the Boston Tea Party as people celebrate its 245th anniversary. Draw a graph that shows the impact on the coffee market. The price of tea is doubling. What's going to happen to the coffee market, assuming that coffee and tea are substitutes? All right, let's do it together. So we know this is our tea market here. Oops. This is our T market, so I'm just going to put a T. We have our initial price, initial quant. I'm sorry. No, we're looking at the coffee market. T is a substitute, so I'm just do a big black C here. 
So we're looking at the coffee market. That's our initial price, initial quantity. Tea has doubled in price. It's twice as expensive. Are people going to want more or less coffee? Of course they're going to want more because tea is more expensive. They'll sub it out. They'll get coffee instead. So demand will shift to the right. And when demand shifts to the right, we'll have an increase in price and an increase in quantity because of our new equilibrium. So far, so good. Let's keep going. There's another related good, and these are called complementary goods. I like to think of this as kind of the hot dog and the hot dog bun, right? So when the price goes up of a complementary good, another good, then it's going to impact the primary good. So let's look at the hot dog and the bun. If hot dogs double in price, they're the complementary goods. Hot dogs double in price. What's going to happen to the demand for hot dog buns? Hot dogs are more expensive. Hot dog buns price hasn't changed. Hot dogs are more expensive. Are people going to demand more or less of our hot dog buns? Of course, people are going to demand less, right? There's an inverse relationship because I can't buy hot dogs. They're too expensive, so I have no use for hot dog buns. None at all. And vice versa. If hot dogs go way down in price, what's going to happen to hot dog buns? Well, I'm going to buy all these hot dogs because they're super cheap. Well, I'm going to demand more hot dog buns to go along with them. So price goes down for hot dogs. Demand goes up for hot dog buns. There's an inverse relationship with complementary goods. Let's try it real quick. Let's say the price of jelly falls due to a dramatic overproduction caused by a gross miscalculation of the success of Just Jelly Marketing Campaign featuring Benedict Cumberbatch. I'm fun with this one. Um, so, so the price of jelly is falling. We've overproduced. Draw a graph that shows the impact of this fall in price of jelly on the peanut butter market, assuming they are complementary goods. All right, let's try it together. Now we're looking at the peanut butter market here. Oops, the peanut butter market. So we'll put P and B. And in the peanut butter market, we know that price has fallen for jelly. So what's going to happen to peanut butter? Well, I can buy all this jelly for super cheap. I need peanut butter to go with it. So the demand for peanut butter is going to go up. If the price falls for the complementary good, the demand rises for the primary good. That gives us an increase in price. Right here, P2 it goes up. And that gives us an increase in quantity, Q2. It goes up. All right, let's keep going. Ooh, get rid of that. There we go. Uh, there's another thing called consumer expectations, which is a determinant or shifter of demand. Consumer expectations simply means if I expect the price to be higher tomorrow, then I'm going to buy less today. Or I'm sorry, I'm going to buy more today. And if I expect the price to be lower tomorrow, I'm going to buy less today. Right? That makes sense? So for Black Friday, that's the best example that we have. If I expect the prices to be higher in the future because of the incredible discounts that we have today because it's Black Friday. And I'm going to buy everything now because I know the prices are going to be higher in the future. Right? So that's consumer expectation. That's why Black Friday is so popular. Now, if you're going to buy a TV and it's the week before Black Friday, are you going to buy that TV now or are you going to wait until Black Friday when you expect the prices to be lower? If you were smart, you would wait until Black Friday, right? So if I expect the prices to be lower in the future, then I'll buy less today. Direct relationship there. I expect the prices to be higher in the future. I'll buy more today. Less in the future, less today. Okay? Consumer expectations also impact our income. If I expect to lose my job and my income to drop, then I'm going to save as much money as I can. So I'm going to buy less today, which means demand's going to fall. But if I win the lottery and I expect to have a bunch of money coming in, then I'm going to demand more of everything right away. So demand is going to go up today if I expect to have more income in the future. Let's try it out. Due to a tropical storm, gasoline prices are way up. Most expect the prices to be lower by the end of the week. Draw a graph that shows the impact on the gasoline market today. I expect prices to be lower in the future. Well, if you did this correctly, and we're going to start picking up the speed here just so that you're not doing this all night. Uh, if you did this correctly, you think, okay, well, the prices are going to be cheaper in the future. 
Should I buy gasoline today? And the answer is absolutely not. So demand is going to shift to the left, draw a parallel demand curve, arrow shifting to the left. We're going to have a new equilibrium point. You're going to show price falling from that equilibrium, and you're going to show quantity falling as well. So if I expect prices be lower in the future, I demand less today, so I can take advantage of that lower price in the future. Okay. Final one is income. Income impacts goods a little bit differently. We have normal goods, and we have inferior goods, and they're just what they sound like. So if I have more income, then I'm going to buy more of normal goods, like TVs, for example. But if it's an inferior good, like a used good or ramen noodles is a classic example of this, when my income goes up, I don't want that good anymore. I'm buying it simply because I'm poor and I can't afford to buy a better product. So when income rises, there's a decrease in the demand for inferior goods. When I graduate college and I get my salary, I'm going to buy less ramen noodles because I don't have to anymore. That's the idea there. Let's try one out. The economy has recovered from a terrible recession. Incomes are rising across the nation. Draw two graphs, one that shows the impact on cable subscriptions and one that shows the impact on used, that's a key word for inferior, used cars. Show the change in price and quantity. All right, let's try it out. I only have one graph here, so we'll just do it separately. So if people expect their incomes to rise, right, because of the change or we're recovering from a recession, first we have cable subscriptions. What's going to happen to the demand for cable? Of course, the demand for cable is going to go up, and then price is going to rise, and quantity is going to rise. As people get their money back, they'll get their cable subscription again. If uh, What's going to happen to used cars? Well, used cars are considered an inferior good, so the demand for used cars Cars up here. The demand for used cars is going to go down, price will fall, quantity will fall. I have more income, so I'm going to buy a new car instead of a used car. Make sense? All right. So if you're like, man, that's a lot of determinants, maybe this will help you remember Tibber or Ty Bear or T Ty, no, I think Ty Beer uh -huh. uh, will help you remember the different determinants, change in taste change in income, change in the number of buyers, change in consumer expectations, and change in related goods, complementary goods, um, and substitute goods. Okay? Just a quick reminder, a change in price does not shift the curve. A change in price changes quantity and demand. It's movement along the curve, right? Because it's price and quantity. So if price goes from 30 to 15, it doesn't shift the curve, it's just a different point on the curve, right? Which gives us a different quantity. So remember, a change in price is just movement along the curve. Anything other than price, timber, change in taste, change in income, a change in buy, number of buyers, change in consumer expectations, and then change in related goods. Any of those will shift the curve left or to the right. Okay, originally I was going to do the entire video, but we're, uh, that's way too much time. So we're just going to split this up. Shift in supply is going to be our next video, and that has everything to do with cost. Take a break, relax, and then the next video is forthcoming.